Hey, deserving listeners, it's time for me to react to your comments from my videos from last week, Daniel and Moh- Danielle and Muhammad video. Danny says, I really love that you advocated for the kids and their emotional well-being in all of this. Makes my inner child feel seen. Thank you. Yeah, it's something that often doesn't get talked about. But I, as a family therapist and as an individual therapist, have seen a lot of the ongoing damage that can be done to children when they are triangulated or enmeshed with. And listen to all my episodes on triangulation and enmeshment and other kinds of things. Christine says, realizing that your guardian parent or whoever is responsible for you is unreliable and unstable is a scary feeling. It is like drowning and realizing that the safe haven is actually a mirage and now you have nothing to hold on to. Yes, Christine, that is a very apt metaphor. Uh, Majestically Awkward says, my parents brought toxic partners into my life as a kid and it was so painful. Hearing you talk about this was so validating of my feelings and experience, thank you. Yeah, hearing these comments makes me uh, think that this experience isn't discussed enough in our society, that a lot of people are walking around with the damage and pain and anxiety of having parents who have loose boundaries or triangulate their children or overburden their children with their own adult concerns. And there's no discussion of what it's like to be a survivor of that. Um, which, you know, I guess doesn't really surprise me. I mean, we tend to invalidate all sorts of experiences that people go through, but maybe particularly this one. Uh, Good old Hoop Jean says, I think I'm mostly alone on this island, but I feel like Muhammad has a right to leave her, and the way she tries to hunt down him and force him to be with her is weird and crossing a boundary. He told her that they are broken up, so he should be allowed to date other women. Yeah, absolutely. Are people are people saying the opposite of that? Are people saying that Muhammad has no right to leave Danielle? Because yeah, he has every right to leave her. Uh, now we question. I, a lot of people question whether he was in it to win it ever, but uh, he absolutely has every right to leave her, a hundred percent. And I'm curious as to why people would say otherwise. Uh, Corey and Evelyn. Anonymous listener emailed in, went to the website, uh, psychologyinseattle.com, hit, hit the contact button. That's the best way. If you ever want to reach me, that that's that's really the only way that you can reach me is to go to the website and mm-hmm. fill out the form there. It has a bunch of caveats or disclaimers of just like, I can't provide therapy. I can't provide a ref, you know, a reference to another therapist. Cause I don't, I don't really know people in your area. So it, you know, it runs through all that, but, but I have been reading those emails for years and responding to them sometimes in these videos and also making episodes, audio episodes in which I, you know, respond to emails. I, I set it as a goal of mine to, to include every email in a episode. Uh, there's been a lot more emails lately, so uh, it's hard, it's impossible for me to do that. But but I do try to get to, especially to upper tier patrons. So if you're an upper tier patron and you, or an annual patron, by the way, and you email in, just make sure you include that and we'll, you know, uh, put your email on priority. Um, anonymous listener regarding Corey and Evelyn says, I was at the end of a four year relationship and my self-esteem was pretty low. Then I met this coworker that was immediately into me and loved to make me laugh and give me small presents and do all sorts of things for me. I felt great even though I knew I didn't like him that much. This led to me treating him really cold when he got too close, telling him I did not want anything serious, but at the same time giving him attention and leading him on when I felt down or felt alone. This went on for a year where I made him Uh, keep things secret when we were together. Then I realized that I didn't really like him. Well, we have been together for eight years and we are married now. I also don't wear my ring all the time like Evelyn. Yeah, this is interesting. So the anonymous listener is basically describing what could be the experience of Evelyn, which is uh, heading into the relationship with Corey. Evelyn might have felt really down and alone. And it just felt good to have someone pay attention to her and love her, even though she's like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm not really into this guy, but 
he makes me feel loved. He makes me feel not alone. And if you have particular relational traumas that lead to, um, I think I have dog hair in my face. It's tickling me. Um, and then when you maybe push the quarries of the world away and suddenly you feel the loneliness kick in and then it's like desperation of like, okay, I need to get him back instead of like, well, I'm lonely, but I, I shouldn't be with Corey. I should actually look for someone that I want to be with. And you rinse and repeat that process. And soon enough, you're, you know, sooner or later, you're married and you're thinking, why am I even in this relationship? Interesting detail that the anonymous listener said that they don't wear their ring all the time uh, as well, maybe because they're continually ambivalent about whether or not to be married at all. So it gives us some insight possibly into why Evelyn would be on one hand openly ambivalent about wanting to be with Corey at all from the beginning of their relationship. She was extremely ambivalent. So she's, you know, being that way on one hand, but on the other hand, not breaking up with him officially or in a consistent way and agreeing to marry him without really wanting to, you know, it, we could see an underlying issue of fear of being alone, fear of not being able to find someone else, the needs that this person provides them of pumping up their ego that they can't get other places very easily. Uh, and and th when people need their ego to be pumped up, it's because of relational traumas that they're trying to make up for. So, yeah, I think that's a totally viable hypothesis that the anonymous listener is speaking from the inside of. Uh, Deanna says, Evelyn is ambivalent about Corey, so she tests Corey. Then Evelyn appears genuinely hurt when he acts single. It's so confusing. Yeah, from the outside, it's definitely confusing. When we hypothesize about what's driving all that, it's less confusing. Enzo says, is it healthy for couples to go on multiple breaks like them? I can't imagine how it would be good for a long-term relationship. It seems like Corey and Evelyn try to make their breaks as a way to cool down and avoid taking and avoid talking about their conflicts. Yeah. Um, so, by the way, if you want to comment below on any of my videos and ask a question of me, it's much more likely to work its way into this um you know, comment video because, uh, you know, it just makes sense that that's where I'd take care of it. Um, and so Enzo is saying, you know, is it healthy for couples to go on breaks like them? It depends. Is it a sign of trouble? Yeah. But, you know, there's no generalization that we can make. There are people who eventually find happiness who have been on multiple breakups. I've worked with couples who have been through multiple breakups and with work and with uh, understanding of their attachment injuries and their attachment reactivity and 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 their of, of, of their partner they can actually um, have a lot of improvement in their relationship so you know it, it's it's a sign of of problems but it's it's not necessarily unhealthy you know what does that mean unhealthy exactly and then you say that that they are they make their breaks as a way to cool down and avoid talking about their conflicts. Yeah, I mean, I would say that's more Evelyn's issue be, potentially because Corey, ha I don't think ever wants to break up. So you know, I don't think Corey is on board with it. Although I guess maybe you're saying that Corey goes along with the breakup as a way of of saying, okay, I guess we're cooling down. And yeah, if that's what you're saying, then I agree with that because they they seem to because Corey has talked about how there's been multiple breakups up until this point and that they just have a pattern to it. And it seems like it's now become entrenched as a mechanism of their relationship for Evelyn to maybe get some space or to complain and for him to prove himself to her or something, which is not unhealthy also because there should be another way. You should be able to communicate about your needs rather than breaking up with someone and hoping that, you know, they learn from their quote unquote mistakes. Lisa says De Beers absolutely started that camp. So I was talking about how the ridiculousness or I don't know, the potential ridiculousness of wedding and marriage 
capitalism and how how much it costs. You know, I, I'm old, so I've been around back in the day when, like in the 70s and 80s, it wasn't nearly as expensive to get married as it is today in, in middle class America. And they say, you know, Lisa says, De Beers absolutely started that that campaign about by advertising, isn't she worth three months of salary? It worked really well. I was in the diamond industry for 20 years, so I know all about it and it's pretty awful. Yeah, I mean, just imagine that some other marketing, uh, you know, group came out with this, with something else like, I don't know, what would be an arbitrary thing that you would buy your partner? Well, how about like, a super expensive Gucci handbag. Is Gucci handbag, is that a thing? I don't know. Um, uh, Louis Vuitton, you know, imagine that for whatever reason, Louis Vuitton comes out and says, isn't your wife worth it to, to spend six months of your salary on a really fashionable handbag? We would all look at that and say, no, that's ridiculous. Six months of your salary, or even three months of your salary, for a handbag, uh, no. I mean, if that's what you want to do, fine. That's how you want to spend your money. But we would see it for what it is. But for whatever reason, when it came to the diamond industry and wedding rings, we just said, "Oh yeah, you know." It, people will just say that. You know, people will say, I, you know, "I'm shopping for a, a engagement ring." You know, I'm trying to figure out how, what sort of price range am I even looking at? Because when I go to the go to the jewelry store, like these engagement rings are expensive. I mean, they're thousands of dollars and I only earn like 50,000 a year or something. And I don't, you know, what's going on here? Well, you know, you're supposed to spend three. I, I remember that being told to me, you know, it's just like, just kind of don't, don't spend more than that, but don't spend less. Definitely don't spend less. Be and that's, you know, a general guideline. Now, again, if you want to do that, then great. But you have to it's like a cultural mandate it if you don't it means you don't actually love your partner <laughs> i mean what you know again let's go to the louis vuitton handbag that that uh, someone again this is all heterosexual relationships for the most part that you as a man would feel ashamed of yourself and that you weren't expressive of your love enough because you weren't spending well you know 50,000 three months, one twelfth <laughs> math. What is that like? Uh, so it's so, so one fourth, sorry, one fourth of that's easier. Uh, is that $12,000? Yeah. So about 13,000. So imagine that to, you know, 50, you're earning $50,000 a year. Cause you know, a lot of people who are getting married, they're in their twenties, you know, or they're getting engaged in their twenties. And so it's not like it's typical to have a, a higher income. So, you know, 50 grand a year. And, you know, that's gross, right? So you're probably taking home 40 and you're spending 20 on rent and another, you know, anyway. And you're supposed, so with that 20,000 of, you know, discretionary income that you spend on food and a car payment and all this, you're supposed to eke out another 12,000 to pay for a handbag, for example. We would see that for what, anyway, for whatever reason with diamonds, we, we don't. <laughs> Again, if you want to do it, great. But and diamonds are great, you know, they're they're pretty. But the fact that we've just swallowed it as like a given is really a feat of marketing that De Beers apparently, uh, you know, imposed on us. And I'm and the way things are going, because in my head it was two months when I was younger. But so in, if if things keep going this way, eventually it'll be a year of your income, and that's the definition of a good heterosexual husband, you know. Uh, Katie says, as a Spanish speaker, so going back to Corey and Evelyn, as a Spanish speaker, I can confirm that Evelyn did say they were broken up. It was not a 90-day botched translation. In fact, she said terminado, which literally means finished, right? So I was asking people, did they translate that wrong? Because we're trying to figure out, did Evelyn actually break up? Because she, she said multiple different things and a lot hinges on that idea, right? Amber says, my favorite line is when Kirk said, I don't know if Evelyn comes from a different logic place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I vaguely remember saying something like that. Yeah. I mean, anyway, so Amber says, Dr. Honda, you're too diplomatic. It cracks me up. Yeah. Well, one... I want to be fair. 
two, I don't want to be critical. I want to help. <laughs> three, I don't want to be like uh, the other internet sort of thing, you know, or a sizable internet thing of just like being mean to people. Uh, why? <laughs> I don't I like, uh, I, so it just doesn't feel good to be. Also, some of these people, if not a lot of them, watch my videos. You know, I was, if I were on one of these shows, and especially if I was like, you know, maybe not one of the main, like sometimes I wonder, well, Darcy, she's probably super famous, so she probably doesn't watch, but who knows? But people like Evelyn and Corey, you know, they're essentially just regular people who are in this niche TV, internet, fame area. You know, most people, they probably, Corey can probably walk down the street of Seattle and no one would recognize him. You know what I mean? Well, maybe not. Who knows? Anyway, point is, is that I want, you know, some of them will watch my video. Some of them will even email me or DM me or something. And, um, and along those lines, actually, someone said something. Where is it here? They, uh, Caroline said, Jessica from Love is Blind gave you a shout out today on the Whitney Cummings podcast, which I have to say is pretty amazing because Whitney Cummings, uh, I think, is hilarious when she was on Workaholics. <laughs> she's, and as a stand up, she's she's funny. I mean, she can be real you know, over the top sometimes. But anyway, she's she's hilarious. And so, you know, Jessica has watched and, and that sort of thing. And so I don't want to I don't want if they're watching which is just a good rule of thumb to follow. Like, um, I, I, I'm in the practice of, I was in, I've been in the practice of this for a long time. Like one of the things that you're supposed to do when you're taking, when you're writing notes, uh, session notes for, for your, you know, sessions with your clients, you're supposed to imagine your client is looking over one shoulder and a lawyer is looking over the other shoulder. So everything in your in the client file should be okay. You, you should because the client can see your, their file at any time, and lawyers are obviously concerned concerned with you being sued and that sort of thing. And so, I think I've always you know, I've been trained to think, well, you know, what if what if this person heard this? And so, when I'm consulting about a client, I, I try to think, well, what if they were sitting right here? Would I say it this way? Would I say it? How would I say it if they were sitting right here? Because I think that's a good rule to follow. You know, if you're talking crap about your spouse, for example, imagine your spouse is sitting right there. How would you say it differently? Now, you know, sometimes you need to vent or, or whatever, but I think it we that practice, we enter a more differentiated state where we're like, well, if they were sitting right here, now, of course, if you're in an abusive relationship, you know, it's completely different, but if you're not, it makes you enter into a reasonable place. It's like, well, I want to say this, but is that really fair? And you know, with Evelyn, um, I feel bad for Corey, uh, to be honest, you know, that's my, that's my countertransference is I just, I feel, I feel his pain or I feel his pain for him. You know, I guess it's one way to think about it is that he doesn't seem to acknowledge what he's going through. Now, who knows, you know, what's really happening behind the scenes. But if, if what we're seeing is any indication, he, he's being harmed and not tremendously. So, you know, not like Angela and Michael or something, but but he's being harmed, and it's at least from my perspective. And one of the, I guess, this is one thing we can learn from is that when we, the emotions we feel sometimes is an indication of what someone else is, is suppressing. So if we feel hurt and then anger when we're watching Evelyn and Corey, it might be because Corey is suppressing his hurt and his, and thus his anger, and we're we're feeling it for him. We've been triangulated in to their conflict. And we can use that knowledge to think about how other triangles are happening in our life, like with, with a friend or a family member, even your spouse. Like one of the common experiences, your spouse, come home, your spouse comes home and complains about their work and you get angry because you're hurt and afraid. And you're now kind of yelling at your partner to quit their job instead of recognizing that your partner might feel like they have to suppress their hurt and their anger because they have to put up with their boss or whatever. Now, it doesn't mean that your feelings need to go away. It just means it's like, huh, I'm feeling a lot of anger right now at your boss and kind of anger at you for not quitting or, or being assertive with your boss. Okay, what's happening for me? Anger is usually a result of fear or pain. So what am I afraid of? Well, I'm afraid of my partner being mistreated. I'm hurt on behalf of my, I'm hurt because my, 
my partner's boss is hurting my partner and by extension me kind of and then kind of use differentiated right so okay i can see my feelings i can feel them and they're there and they're real and they're good and they're fine and they're welcomed but they're not like gonna drive the bus here and so i'm gonna tell my partner i, I just feel really sad about what you're going through I, I feel i feel hurt about what's going through and i feel afraid that this is going to be an ongoing thing you just speak from that primal primary emotion place instead of getting angry and you know and so when we're watching Corey and evelyn notice the feelings because it's a good practice time of just like okay well i'm really angry at evelyn okay but what's going on underneath it? well i guess i'm afraid for the two of them i'm afraid for Corey, and Corey isn't expressing his anger or his hurt or his fear and so i'm feeling it for him you know it's just so when i'm watching and i'm, I'm like uh you know i, I want to say something that's knee jerk and instinctual if you will but then i differentiate and i'm like well wait what's happening for me right now really and at, at its baseline I just don't understand Evelyn's logic all the time. But when I have a good conceptualization that I've been developing over time, by the way, I feel like the past few weeks, I've very quickly gotten to what I feel is a very doable conceptualization. My dog is barking about Evelyn that makes it so much clearer. You know, even like the person who wrote in and said, you know, I, I felt lonely and uh, this I didn't I wasn't really into him, but he made me feel good. And whenever I was lonely, I'd go back to him and sort of pull him in. And you know, it just kind of worked out that way. Anyway, Ariella and Binium. By the way, I m might be mispronouncing Ariella or Ariella, <laughs> and it's because for the first number of episodes. Uh, the only per I'm always listening to how people pronounce because I don't know how they pronounce their names because they typically don't say my name is blah blah blah. It's someone else saying their name, right? Like when Larissa said her name, she's like, "My name is Larissa." So I was like, "Okay, Larissa." With uh, Ariella, the only person I heard that said her name was her mom, and her mom has I think some kind of East Coast accent, and she says "Ari." She, if you listen, the mom clearly said calls her. Air, or kind of a air. I can't do it because I'm not East Coast, you know, North Northeast. It's a, it's an airy. It sounds like airy to me. So I was like, it must be Ariella, which doesn't sound right to me. But you know, what are you gonna do? And then eventually, I, I like episodes in, I heard someone say Ari or Ariella. I was like, wait, what's happening? I really want to get these names right. <laughs> Maybe I should. I don't know. Is there a, is it on a website? Maybe. Anyway, Day, Diane says, I remember actually Diane Bernacki. I feel like I knew a Bernacki in my youth. I remember 27 years ago, a day after my older daughter was born, the nurse was showing me how to bathe her. When we began, my daughter started crying and screaming. I bursted into tears and I thought I was harming her. Postnatal hormones are real. Yeah, absolutely. So when Ari is having some ups and downs about her feelings with Binium, it makes sense that, I don't know, it's possible that, you know, perinatal, it's not just postnatal, it's, you know, around birth time, the months around birth that one's hormones can be shifting, obviously, and that can affect one's emotions which can affect our interpretations and our moods and our reactivity for sure absolutely uh resi says what about if a couple cannot agree about getting their kid vaccinated against COVID?" yeah so this episode was about the um about the circumcision what about if a couple cannot agree about getting their kid vaccinated against COVID? my husband is giving me a really hard time about that I am vaccinated and I am pro-vaccination. He is not vaccinated and he is against the vaccine mandate. And we are arguing if young kids should get the vaccine or not. Well, I don't know, Rezzy. I mean, the political ridiculousness that is happening in our country around COVID and the vaccine is just incredible. I, I remember when the when COVID was first being you know, realized in our society in what, like March of 2020, I was actually really happy because I said, okay, we are, we have to re we have to have a, a, 
you know, global, if not, you know, national response. We got to band together on this thing because if, because I, I know enough from experts who have taught me about pandemics that you, you have to work as a team. You got to work together and only then can you mitigate the deaths and the pain and the suffering and the shutdowns. If we all work together as one, you know, we can, we can do this. And I thought, how often can, you know, the United States, the people of the United States work together on something? But I said, but this is different because this is not a political thing. I mean, just imagine thinking that, that vaccines and COVID was not a political thing. You know, the flu, Ebola, these kinds of things were not really politicized. They were kind of, depending on who was president, you know, if you had a Democratic president who, you know, uh, didn't react fast enough, then, it, you know, anyway, point is, is that there were some partisan discussions around, you know, pandemics and vaccines. But but really minimal to the point where I thought we're going to do this thing because Republicans and Democrats, they don't fight about this issue. This is just we're all in this together. We all understand that, you know, the bird flu or MRSA or Ebola, it's terrible and it kills doesn't it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter who it is. It's going to kill someone. So this is great and great, you know, and then within weeks, <laughs> it became politicized by certain politicians and our response as a system just bifurcated our society not completely but you know definitely there's a rift that i to my knowledge did not exist before politicians it's like if politicians just said nothing if they just didn't say anything we would have been better off i, I think i think if the politicians said nothing then we would just turn to the experts, you know, but everyone listens to Paul. So my advice, Rezzy, you're like, you know, how do I, how do I deal with my husband who da da da? Well, what I'd say is do your best to, in a diplomatic fashion, say, let's listen to our physician. Let's listen to scientists. Let's listen to groups of science, you know, the consensus. What is that? You're, you're always going to find some fringe scientists. You know, there are fringe scientists who don't believe that humans are a cause of global climate change. Something like 0.1% of climate scientists, 0.1%, you know, one out of a thousand. Okay, you're always going to find one out of a thousand or somewhere around there who don't acknowledge for whatever ideological reason or there's just something wrong with them. They just ignore the data. You know, a recent study came out, something like 99.9% .9 of scientists agree that, uh, you know, um, global climate change is human cost influence at the very least, which of course makes sense, you know, and, it, and we've known that for a long time. So anyone can find one scientist to support your thing, particularly on Facebook and Instagram, well, mainly Facebook and Twitter, the internet. Um, but it's the consensus, my friends. <laughs> What is the consensus? And the consensus is clear that the risks of not taking the vaccine are far greater than if you take the vaccine. Are there risks of taking the vaccine? Yeah. But the risks of not taking the vaccine, I mean, we got long COVID, we got potential vectoring. Of course, you got potential death. <laughs> so... I don't know, Rezzy, you know, and I'm sure right now there are plenty of people, you know, downvoting this or commenting below or unsubscribing or or literally give, you know, people get death threats over talking about the science of this sort of thing because of the way politicians and certain echo chambers. And by the way, Russian peop, Russian accounts that are trying to mess with American society, you know, that's a real thing. If you want to talk about a conspiracy theory, that's that's real. That's happening. In fact, to the point where, anyway, Rizzi, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I, t I don't know what to do. Um, I'm incredibly scared for everyone. So many people have died. So many people have gotten sick. So many people have long COVID where their brain doesn't work quite, quite right. Their lungs don't work quite right. And it's just getting worse. You know, the variants are more virulent, more damaging. And 
it, it feels like we're on the downward slope, but we're really not. When you look at the stats, like it's worse than ever right now, particularly in some regions. And, you know, the future will hold, you know, we'll, you know, we'll figure out what um, we'll, we'll see. I don't, I don't have any words. <laughs> uh, let's move on. Um, Heather says, over the weekend, I approached my partner of five years like this. Okay, so this is the episode where Ariella grabs Binium's phone. Over the weekend, I approached my father, my partner of five years like this, like grabbing the phone or something, or accusing him of things, after we had a fight so major that I thought for certain we were breaking up. Thanks to Dr. Honda and these videos, I've learned an entire new way of approaching and addressing my relational traumas and I 100%, 100% believe that it saved most of my treasured relationship. Instead of white knuckling it, we're going to couples therapy in a couple weeks and I couldn't be more excited and grateful. Thank you, Dr. Honda, be the corn. Oh, well, this comment couldn't come at a better time. What a wonderful thing, Heather. Heather. This is why I do this thing. Um, so, you know, you are helping me realize the dream of my life, which is, helping people to improve their relationships so they can get their attachment needs met and going to therapy. So good for you, Heather. Good old Run Lola Run says, I liked how you emphasized loyalty, love, and consideration. We all want these and won't get them through controlling our partner. Yeah, absolutely. Gingy Buns says, I mean, if she's asking to see the phone, if Ariella is asking to see the phone to verify nothing is going on, and he says just a second and starts using it, many people, particularly jealous people, would then take that as he is deleting evidence of cheating before he hands the phone over and panic would definitely set in. I assume that's what's happening here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If, if you're like, give me your phone because I want to verify nothing's happening. And the person's like, oh, wait a second. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, obviously that's a sign that some shenanigans are happy. It's not automatic. You know, some people might be like, well, I'm not deleting cheating things, but I was complaining about her, you know, to my friends. So I should probably get rid of that, that thing right there. Or I don't know, just some other privacy thing. Maybe he was looking at porn. He doesn't want her to see what he was looking at. You know, people can have privacy, right? So it's not automatic, but absolutely would, if you're a jealous type, a preoccupied type, would that trigger you? Absolutely. But what do you do with that, right? That's the key. Does that justify grabbing someone's phone? A hundred percent no. Uh, or Soliot says, my boyfriend said, let's go to couples therapy. Me, before I said, no, I don't want to go to couples therapy. Then one month after I started watching Dr. Honda, this is what I said, boyfriend of mine, I've been watching this thing called psychology in Seattle and I think I might be avoidant attachment style and you might be preoccupied. Let's go to couples therapy. One and a half years later, we are still together, happier and more satisfied. Thank you, Dr. Honda. Just wonderful comment. I just love that so much. <laughs> and the fact that you are like, you know, I think I'm the avoidant. And that is frequently. The preoccupieds typically are the ones. Let's go to therapy. And the avoidants are like, no. Um, Smriti, uh, Jenny and Summit, we're moving on. Uh, Smriti says, Indian woman here, most conservative Indian parents would move in with their sons to establish the power dynamic and prevent their son from being too influenced by their spouse. Since most couples are arranged to be married, their relationship only develops after getting married. So moving in with the couple after the honeymoon phase is all too common to maintain a stronghold on their son. I believe Indian men lack an ability to push back or are conditioned to appease their parents over their spouse. That's interesting. So it sounds like a frequent thing in Indian culture, according to Smriti, that the mother-in-law will want to uh, you know, heavily influence what's happening in the house because she wants, you know, control over her son and doesn't want his wife to have any kind of influence. Sasset says, I find it interesting that Summit's parents are so concerned about bringing shame to their family, but yet they know they are on TV show acting, on a TV show acting the way they are acting. Yeah. So this lends itself to the you know, hypothesis that the parents are totally fine with the way they're acting because 
they are operating within their cultural norm, uh, like what Sreethi said. So uh, to them, I think it's clear that to them, they think Jenny is making a fool out of herself. And they think that they are absolutely righteously acting upon their rights as parents and in the best interest of Summit. And that's why when you you know, marry someone from a different culture, things like this can happen because people just have completely different ideas about what's good in life, you know, to apparently an Indian family like this, what is good in life is to marry someone who is your age uh, to the point where the opposite is like a hundred billion percent wrong and bad, you know, it's sort of be like if you are in a you know, heavily vegetarian family, for example, and you're, you're dedicated to vegetarianism, you're dedicated to animal rights and all that kind of thing. And then your, your daughter marries someone who eats meat. In your family, you could see that to be, you know, a big problem. You're marrying the enemy, that kind of thing, you know? And so it's the culture of the family. We could, we could imagine that, right? And so, uh, but it's different. To, to another family, they might not care one way or another who their daughters are marrying regarding whether or not they meet or not, right? Or even the opposite, right? You can have families where politically they're like, we eat meat and we hate vegetarians. And then, you know, their daughter marries a vegetarian. It, you know, it could be a big thing. People think about these things differently. And it's important to find out those cultural differences before getting too involved with someone and to, and to really consider them strongly not to be like well i can change that because you might not be able to like what jenny and summit featherbrain says this episode is particularly triggering to me because i come from a south asian background and my in-laws are toxic af and it's always the boy's parents it's all about wanting to maintain control over their son and not wanting him to live an independent life with his new wife most of it is because they are relying on their son to take care of them financially and physically in their old age and so would rather and so would rather their son have a bad marriage and be around them for them than have a healthy marriage and move away. Yeah. Uh, good old sister magical says Jenny and Summit have said they can't move to the US because of money. Jenny doesn't make enough money to sponsor him. Interesting, because that is one of the questions. Like, why don't they just go to the States? So Jenny says she doesn't have enough money to sponsor him, which is kind of surprising because, you know, Nicole didn't have enough money to sponsor uh, Azan, but they, anyway. Uh, uh, the kitchen episode with Jenny and Summit. Paulina says, I don't know what I hated more. The fact that the mom was putting all the housekeeping responsibility on Jenny or that Summit was so happy seeing Jenny clean and stuff. The whole scene was so infuriating. Paulina agree. Uh, Olivia says, I'm from Eastern Europe and we have the same sexist culture as Summit's mom is exhibiting. Just like the story about your grandmother, we have countless generations of women berated by their mother-in-law. That's why seeing these scenes did not make me angry, even though I am a feminist and rationally I understand it's Summit's job to clean too. Instead, it triggered secondhand embarrassment for Jenny and deep shame. Luckily, I have a great therapist and I'm working on unlearning these musts in my head, you know, musts like you must. Thank you as well, Dr. Honda, for the validation. It truly helps. Yeah, uh, these sexist, misogynistic ideas get quite ingrained in our brains and take a long time. You know, it's it's you know it's easier said than done to just sort of shed those ideas. Uh, Jessica says, in traditional Indian households, a daughter-in-law serves a handful of purposes. She is the bearer of children. She is the caretaker of the parents and of the family. She's a household caretaker and a companion to the husband. When Indian families look for a wife for their son, they're also looking for someone who will take uh, on the caretaker maid mother role within the home. And it's not the expectations themselves that are bad. When a daughter-in-law enters the home, mother-in-laws have this tendency to throw their hands up in the air and say, I'm done, you have to do everything now. 
And that's what I think is really cruel. The daughter-in-law is expected to take care of everyone in the home without complaining. Otherwise, she is shamed or the son is convinced to divorce her. Some families are moving towards a different approach where everyone pitches in for the household. But from my experience, it typically only occurs in households where the daughter-in-law also works outside the home. Most families still hold on to a traditional mindset. So that's very interesting, Jessica. And I think what that... Uh, for the first time, I feel like I've, I finally get it. <laughs> I think I get it. I don't know if this is true. And let me know what you think. But if Indian culture is extremely sexist and the way they manifest their sexism is saying that women have to take care of men, they have to do all the work, they have, you know, they have to put themselves on the back burner, they, they don't have rights, they don't have lives, they don't have dreams, they don't have careers, they don't have wants, they don't have needs. They're only there to serve the men. If you are Summit's mom and you've been taught that from day one and all of your life, and you probably had to take care of your mother-in-law, and, you know, and so as soon as you married into a family, suddenly you're taking care of, you know, and and you are being pressured and abused and bullied into this position of selflessness and be basically you're a slave or a servant to this to your husband's family and you resent it right and you try to push back on it but of course there's a a system of sexism and misogyny that keeps the woman in place and the woman internalizes these ideas that you know, daughters-in-law are supposed to do this, you know, and you just, well, this is your lot in life. You don't deserve dreams. You don't deserve your own life. You don't deserve wants or needs. And so you internalize it and you're being treated this way. And then finally you get a daughter-in-law and you're like, I finally, as a woman, this is my one saving grace. This is my one out. This is my one way out of this system of misogyny and sexism is if she takes over. And she does all of the work, you know, that I have been doing for 55 years. Finally, someone else will come along and I can pass the baton to them because it's the only way out of this system. It's the only way I can get any kind of self-esteem or time or space or thinking time or respect. And so I, it's, it's culturally the one way that I can get happiness or at least relax and take a bath and not have to serve everyone. I, mean, I still have to serve my husband, of course, but I don't have to serve everyone else. And I've internalized the abuser. This message of daughters-in-law need to be put in their place. And so, yeah, daughter, daughters-in-law need to be put in there. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. And then a daughter-in-law comes along, but she's older than you. And you're like, no. <laughs> you know, you're almost to the end of the marathon and someone goes, Oh, you're, you know, you're 30 miles from, from the finish line. You're like, no, 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 no. The whole, my whole life, I've been waiting for a daughter-in-law to come along so that she would be able to take over. Now you could argue, well, the other son's marrying and is married to someone that is of that age. But anyway, you could see the internalized abuser. You could see, you could see, well, I want two women to do all this kind of thing. Or... It, if Jenny's older, that means that the mom is still responsible for everything for submit. So you, when, you th when I think about that, I go, oh, okay, <laughs> I get it. And then of course you give some, you sprinkle in some relational traumas that the mom went through and you get, I think what you get. I, I don't know, let me know what you think about that. Particularly you people who are familiar with South, South Asian culture. Does this make sense? Because if this does make sense, then it to me, I can finally go, oh, I think I understand Summit's mom. Because up until this point, I'm like, okay, even if this is a cultural thing, like, how do you not just adjust a little bit, you know? Like, like when we see Armando's parents who come from a homophobic culture, they're adjusting. You know, we see the dad, you know, there's there's movement. There's like, well, I do love my son and, you know, Kenny is a good guy. And so, you know, there's, there's steps. The mom just seems to be 
there's no movement. And I just think, what is going on? Now, of course, there's relational traumas that could be at play there. She's being triggered a lot. But I don't know. Uh, this would make a lot of sense to me. And it's just really sad. <laughs> if this is true, my goodness. I mean, you know, in the United States, we obviously suffer from sexism and misogyny in a variety of ways, in very intense ways. So, you know, but to see, to, to contemplate South Asian culture, traditional gender role abuse and oppression is sad. You know, I just feel bad for Summit's mom if, the, if this is what she's been through. Stephen and Alina uh, Kant says, it's nice to see one of the U.S. people on 90 Day Fiance speaking fluently in their partner's mother tongue. Just thought I would leave a positive comment to try to balance the mood in the comment section. Wait, so wait, yeah, that is it is interesting to think about. Like he, he seems to speak fluent Russian, and we don't usually see that sort of thing. But the other thing that you're saying here is that you're you need to leave a positive comment to try to balance the mood of the comment section. Is the comment section with Stephen and Lena uh, extremely negative? Because I don't know. To me, the, the couple—they just seem like a really young couple, and they're they're trying to figure things out. They have some pretty obvious incompatibilities, and they also seem to really love each other. So, you know, I, and I, it just seems like a couple. Like if they were friends of mine, I'd be like, well, you know, we'll see. You know, we'll see what happens. And they seem to have some issues. Uh, Kristen says, "I grew up Mormon." The coffee thing is part of something they call the word of wisdom, so it's not a sin. Interesting. So I was at, I, I always assumed, because I'm not familiar with Mormon religion, that the coffee thing was a sin. And, but then Stephen was like, it's not really a sin. And I was like, oh, I, th I always thought it was a sin. But it's actually this word of wisdom. Interesting. Uh, Lisa says, Alina may be an adult, but she strikes me as extremely inexperienced and could benefit from more guidance. Yeah, that's probably true. Hannah says, as a Christian who has also sinned like Stephen, what I find most troubling about Stephen's interpretation of his sinning is his nonchalant, even almost prideful reaction to what he's done. This shows that he does not understand the gravity of the sin in the Christian context, nor does he display any sort of deep regret. Stephen just makes me frustrated because he displays arrogance, pride, selfishness, but thinks he's a good Christian because he doesn't drink alcohol or coffee and says things that sound Christian. Interesting. It is, I wonder if that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, Stephen is uh, triggering to people, or if that happens at all, that he represents some kind of arrogant, uh, sexist, um, I don't know, narcissistic, if, if you want to throw that word in there, self-centered Christian who is holier than thou, but not really following the rule or follows the rules when they want to. And when they, when they break the rules, when they, you know, sin, they are just like, well, you know, moving on in life. Uh, yeah, I could see that. I mean, Stephen certainly seems to exhibit that on the show, but particularly around the, the lying thing. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to, to me anyway, to, you know, commit adultery, as they will say. It's another thing to, on in an ongoing fashion, you know, it wasn't just one lie by omission. It was seemingly over, you know, weeks or months with Alina leading her to believe that he was exclusive to her, that he had not never had sex with anyone else, and that he wanted to marry her and have kids with her, and it was a done deal. Like, that's interesting that you would do that. And the fact that he can't say, ooh, you know, sorry, and, or anything close to that is, I could see that being triggering. Caroline says, Jessica, oh, right. I'm sorry to read that thing. <laughs> the Jessica love is by the Anyway, um, well, that does it for that episode in which I rambled. Every time I start these episodes, I always think, okay, you know, keep your comp, keep your rambling short. <laughs> like, don't, don't just rant, you know, just, you know, 20 minutes episode where you, you know, just casually read. But, you know, your comments are so interesting that it just gets me going on, you know, certain things. Anyway. 
let's all take care of ourselves, right? Because you deserve it. You really, really do.